PJ Glassy here with Dr. Choi. And uh, so I had a chance to meet you recently and we had a great conversation at the X Gym. And it's so exciting to talk to somebody who's like-minded with you know health, fitness, all that kind of stuff. And you've got a very interesting practice. What do you call it where it's the manipulation of the, of the gut, essentially? Uh, visceral, visceral manipulation. Visceral manipulation. And I was so excited to hear you talk about that because I had never heard about that until I talked with you. But it seems to make a lot of sense. And why don't we just start with that? What is it? Why is it useful? Why did you get excited about it? Kind of a little history behind it. Oh, definitely. Um, I never thought I would be, for one, a doctor. And the first time I read about kind of this holistic medicine thing was actually Mark Hyman's book, The Ultramind Solution. Oh, Hyman's great. Love that guy. Yeah, yeah. And that was my first exposure to medicine. So, like, oh, there's something about nutrition and uh, that's really important. I didn't really know anything at that point. And it wasn't until two or three years into my medical training that some of my friends started saying, hey, there's this thing, this, this type of manual therapy called visceral manipulation. And at first, it sounds a little bit like wizardry. You yeah. know, it, it sounds almost painful. Like, we're, we're going to do what to my viscera? You know, my, <laughs> well, what are you going to do to my organs? <laughs> yeah. So when you think of manipulation and viscera, it doesn't sound like the most pleasant experience. Right. How, however, you know, when the body is multi, it's a multi-system unit, right? There's yeah. lots of different things interacting with, you, with each other on the biochemical level, the emotional level, energetic level and the physical level right and one of the naturopathic principles is how do you restore structural function to improve function and health of the organ okay and visceral manipulation is one of those ways to uh, address structural dysfunction in not just the organs but like nerves blood vessels we work with the cranium and the skull okay so it's really about how do we help the organs move properly? Just like your joints or your muscles yeah. move, yeah. you have you have these other structures in that rib cage that are your organs, right. and they also move with you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right? Your liver isn't just floating in space. Sure. It's attached to your diaphragm. It's attached to your ribs, the, and all the other organs have lig ligamentous system. Right. So just like ligaments in your joints can get tight or sprained, you can strain the ligaments around the liver. Uh -huh. uh, that can happen, like just like your brain can get a concussion by sloshing around in your skull. Sure. Your liver can get sloshed around when you are in a car accident. You know, that seatbelt going right across your yep. thorax yep. is right over your liver. So yeah. you can sprain your liver. Yeah. And it, no pill is going to address those structural issues. Mm. No amount of counseling is going to address those those issues. So I, I began to explore, uh, you know, through my teachers at uh, Bastyr and through the Brawl Institute, you know, how can you use your hands to yeah. not just assess the health of an organ, but how can you also help that organ function and move properly so it can so it can serve you better, so it can function right. Yeah, interesting. So. When people come to you and they're in need of visceral manipulation, what are their what's their condition, symptoms, things like that? I see a whole range of symptoms, and it's often not just one symptom, but it's many different. Yeah. Um, I'll give you a few examples. So one of the most common things people come to me for is uh, acid reflux, GERD, ah. gas esophageal reflux disease. It's too common. It's too common. Yeah. So the symptom people experience is acid reflux or heartburn. Yeah. Sometimes it can be actually silent. It, it presents in so many different ways. And that could be an issue with the lower esophageal sphincter, mm -hmm. right? So your esophagus, food mm -hmm. goes through your esophagus and enters your stomach and there's a muscular ring there yeah. that keeps the acid in the stomach. Yeah. But for whatever reason, it, there could be uh, things that uh, compromise that that sphincter, mm -hmm. whether it's like a food trigger, you know, coffee, chocolate, mint, spicy foods. Mm -hmm. Maybe someone got 
is a uh, you know trains in Taekwondo and they're just kicked in the oh. kicked in the you know wow. the abdomen too many times and yeah. that, you know that can cause issues. Structurally. I'd, rather, I'd rather have coffee than a kick to the gut. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also be, people who have trouble digesting fats or digesting you know mm-hmm. maybe have, they have gallbladder problems aren't digesting oh. their food. Yeah. There's a lot of like back pressure pushing the stomach up into your chest. Yeah. So, you know, visceral manipulation is great, great to help correct some of that dysfunction. Yeah. And then we're also doing things like stimulating blood flow to the organs. Yeah. I could see that. That's really important. Yeah, totally. <laughs> for yeah. Function. yeah. Interesting. So when people get certain organs shut, uh, function is shut down. Is a lot of that emotional too? There is a large emotional component. Uh, this system of visceral manipulation, and even Chinese medicine, there's associations between anger in the kidneys, right? Uh, anger in the lungs, you know. And yeah. when you, I guess it's hard for me to understand exactly what the mechanism is. Right. Same here. But you can. When you I was, like work with an organ and ha- and see emotional releases from people. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. That's what I was curious about because I know that with deep tissue massage, sometimes people will will start to laugh or cry, and they have no idea why. They go, "Why am I crying?" Well, it's because we're releasing things out of the tissues because tissues can hold things. Organs are no different, I would assume. So I'm wondering. If, if you're getting some sort of uh, emotional release from people at times when you're doing this as well. That, that can happen. Yeah. You know, uh, I remember the, I was in clinic. I was just learning how to work with the liver. And mm-hmm. someone had come in with a, you know, after a car accident, and I was working on her liver gently, three or four sessions. And after the fourth session, she was like, I can't do this anymore. Wow. I'm like, what do you mean? It's wow. like, I, there was a lot of... There was apparently a past trauma she hadn't told us about. Oh my god! Some type of abuse. That's, and she's like, I, I spent so many years suppressing those feelings, and now all of a sudden, all of a sudden, I am like those those emotions are coming back. No way. You know whether or not it was directly because of what I was doing. Yeah. Yeah. There was a very interesting correlation, and I, I've yeah. seen emotional responses working with my hands on right. people, and right. that's another one of the benefit. I think the powerful um, effects of touch and the yeah. body. Yeah, 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 totally. Ha- are you familiar with Dr. Sarno's work with healing the back? His first book was Healing Back Pain. I think that was his first book. He's had a lot um, where he worked with people basically just talking with them and gets through a lot of back pain issues and other pain in the body. What his thing is, he's discovered, is that when people have a mental emotional issue, maybe it's a past trauma or whatever, um, their brain tells a certain part of their body to start to reduce oxygen flow. Now that part of their body hurts to distract them from the real pain that it doesn't want to address. So it's essentially trying to protect them because it's easier for them to, to have a back problem than to deal with the issue at hand. But then when they deal with that issue and they get the issue out and solved through therapy or whatever they need, the back pain goes away. Yeah, the root cause. Yeah, yeah. Root. yeah. <laughs> Which The just, brain and the body are not separate. No, uh-uh. Especially when you hear about, you know, we have our brain, but we also have a heart brain. And the heart's talking back and forth to the brain all the time because the heart actually has neurons like the brain does. And we have the gut brain. Mm-hmm. And so can you give us an explanation of the gut brain? Because that's a hot topic lately with all the microbiome down there and the communication through the vagus nerve to the brain and all that stuff. And a lot of people are talking about the gut brain and they, they call it the second brain. But what's that all about? And how does that tie in with this, with this um, niche that you do? Yeah, when I think about the gut brain, right? What the brain is a big blob of neurons, your, your nervous system, right? They're like electronic. <clears throat> they send energetic signals back and forth and make connections and help you think. Yeah. But they also sense. And we have 
almost the equivalent around our gut, mm. our stomach, our esophagus, our small intestines. So the role of the the gut brain, you know, those, those things like trust your gut, punch yeah. in the gut, right. you know, and my but my gut, you know, my stomach's full of butterflies when you're nervous. Yeah, right. It's and we think of the digestive tract as you know one of the most uh, power. It's a sensing organ, uh-huh. right? It monitors yeah. what comes in. You know, most of our immune system is in our gut. Yeah. So that is sending information to our brain, to the rest of our body. Uh-huh. Yeah, you know, our our there's neurotransmitters made in the gut. Yeah, you know that affect your mood, right. uh, your your <laughs> your circadian rhythms. Yeah, uh, yeah, true. Because it, isn't it the the biggest source of serotonin? Serotonin, yeah, and and melatonin, mm-hmm. and you know, so if your gut is out of whack, yeah, um, you know, your your mood, you're, you're going to feel pretty crabby, right? So then, you know, when I think of if someone's feeling depressed or down or blue, I always wonder. You know, how are they nourishing themselves? Mm-hmm. What are they nourishing themselves with? Mm-hmm. Uh, what are the conditions under which they're, are they like sitting in a car, chowing down on a bar, yeah. you know, while sitting in traffic? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, right. how, how well can your body assimilate the things you're eating yeah. if you're always stressed out? And when people are stressed out, especially stressed out and other mood issues, um, a lot of times they'll feel it in their gut, of course, and sometimes they'll even get they'll even get torsions down there and blockages down there. So I could imagine that the the visceral manipulation would help with that too. Yeah, motility, right? If we think of the gut not just as a tube, but there are it's a muscular tube. Yeah. So it squeezes and very coordinated movement to move food down and out. You yeah. know, in through the clean hole and out through the, the dirtier hole. <laughs> so, <laughs> and it's a very coordinated process. So if that tube is not functioning well, you're, you're going to have issues like indigestion, gas, bloating, constipation, yeah. uh, nausea, you know, IBS. Right. All those things are just a sign that something is out of whack in your gut. Are most of your patients coming to you because of IBS issues or IBS related things? Yeah, and IBS, so IBS is a syndrome, you know, there might be diarrhea, constipation, mix of both, and it can present in so many different ways. Right. So I'll just say a lot of them have these a syndrome is a way of labeling something as a uh, we don't really know what's going on. <laughs> right. <laughs> and a lot of those types of patients come to see me for help with their, I don't know what's going on yeah. type of digestive issues. So that's a big part of it. How about Crohn's and colitis? Can you help with conditions like that? Yeah, definitely. So Crohn's and colitis is also, uh, you know, affects the large intestines, small intestines. Yeah. And, um, yeah, there's, there's, Visceral manipulation can help with that. Addressing how someone's eating. Yeah. Like, you know, food intolerances. Yeah. Stress is a big one. Yeah. Um, and it's really kind of looking at all the pieces in someone's life. Right. That, um, you know, what's a symptom saying? Like, what is a symptom trying to tell you? Yeah. Is, is how I look at it. Do you have a sense for why we're seeing more frequency of IBS, Crohn's, colitis, that kind of thing? It seems like it's really gone up. The frequency is increasing every year, it seems like to me. Yeah, and I wonder that too. Why are so many people having trouble going to the bathroom? Yeah, right. <laughs> trouble. Like everyone's intolerant to everything. Yeah. I, I think there are a few reasons. You know, one is our environment. Uh, a great way I've heard environment defined is anything that's not you. Yeah, right. So it could be the people you're around, maybe... There's a lot of uh, conflict around, you know, the people you're around. Yeah. A lot more stress, like stimulation from whether you're watching the news too much or you, uh, someone who's working on a, a farm that uses pesticides. There's a lot of chemical exposure yeah. we're not aware of. Yeah. So just the toxic load of everything together could be contributing to why more people are experiencing these issues. 
yeah. trouble with circadian rhythm, right? Uh-huh. More light at night throwing off our natural body yeah. clocks. Yeah. That's a big part of it. Right. And so when you help people with visceral, visceral manipulation um, and they get improvement with that, I'm sure you're also talking to them about things they can do, changes they can make in their life because the visceral manipulation, restoring circulation and communication between the brain and the organs like we talked about is obviously effective and it's great, but if those people don't change the root cause, then it's just going to come back. One of the ways I descri- I've been talking about how I think differently as a naturopathic doctor versus a you know, conventional medical doctor yeah. is so in conventional medicine, you look at a disease, you, you try to find the qualities of something and you put a label on it and you treat yeah. it a certain way. Mm-hmm. So like IBS. Yeah. And as a naturopathic doctor, I, we assume that health is the normal state. Yeah. And a disease as a, a disturbance to the normal state of the body. Gotcha. So what are those obstacles that are creating those symptoms and addressing those? Gotcha. So do you have some sort of interview process or a questionnaire or something to get through, to get to the root cause with your patients? Yeah, a lot of it is spent doing, found out during a, a, like a patient history. Gotcha. So my initial appointment is 90 minutes and I spend yeah. 30 to 45 minutes really looking at all aspects of someone's life yeah. you know, that's related to the issue. Yeah. You can find out 80% of what's going on from a good history. Yeah. So asking the right questions, looking at, you know, from before you were born till your life now, what were the events, yeah. major events in your life yeah. that kind of may have contributed to right. the current issue. Yeah. And I could imagine that a lot of this is due to just general inflammation because that's becoming more and more of an epidemic every year with people. It's just general inflammation. Um which can block a lot of the communication that we're talking about. I can't tell you how many people I talk to who just can't lose weight. They're doing everything right, but because they're toxic and inflamed, they just can't make any progress. So when you, I'm sure you're talking with people quite, quite often about that and, and giving them tips on how to reduce inflammation and this visceral manipulation, I would imagine would help with that as well. Just like, massage or any other kind of thing can help flush tissues and get them more increased circulation and get them moving again. Yeah. And you know, if we think of what inflammation is, how do we define inflammation? Uh, you know, there, there's a four cardinal signs of inflammation, redness, heat, pain, yeah. swelling. It's a normal response of the immune system Yeah. where you sprain your ankle, it should get inflamed. Yeah. Right, fluid fills that area. Immune cells are rushing to that area to repair it, mm-hmm. and you know, and you want some inflammation, yeah, because that's how your body repairs. Right. So the issue is when there is chronic inflammation. Yeah. So that repair process that never ends. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And there's always kind of uh, um, collateral damage uh-huh. with inflammation. Yeah. So if that collateral damage is constantly going on then that's when people start getting really sick. Yeah. The question is, what is causing that chronic inflammation? Mm-hmm. Well, we know a big one is chronic stress. Yeah. Whatever the source it might be, how you're responding to stress. Yeah. Uh, chronic toxic exposure to chemical pollutants, man-made yeah. chemicals in the environment, not sleeping enough. Yeah. Uh, melatonin is one of the major anti-inflammatory hormones and you only make melatonin when it's dark Uh, and when you're sleeping. Yeah. So if you're up late, if you're staring at your screen till 2 (laughs) a.m., you know, your body doesn't, your body's natural anti-inflammatory processes aren't working. Yeah. We have to kind of adapt to our new, uh, our new kind of human environment, which is very different than what people experienced even 40, 50 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, right. We haven't evolved quickly enough to, to deal with these environmental changes. Uh-uh. And as you define environment, that would also include nutrition because that's certainly changed in the last 50 years. And that's decimating our gut microbes. Holy yeah. Smoly. yeah, we didn't even talk about the gut microbiome yet. Yeah, that's the next thing I want to discuss is 
there's a lot of chatter and talk about gut microbiome and how to balance the good with the bad. And is there really any such thing as bad? And you know, what, flir- what nourishes the good, what nourishes the bad? So is it the same kind of thing when they were talking about good and bad gut bacteria? And if there is such a thing as bad gut bacteria, does it still serve a purpose? And should we have it? Or should we have our gut flora 100% good bacteria? How does that whole thing pan out? Yeah, so if we think of, if, some, if this is a new idea to someone, they're like, what? We have bacteria in our body? I, the, the estimates are either there are, it's like a one-to-one bac- micro microbial cell to human cell in your body up to, to 10 times more. Yeah. Somewhere in between there. But it's a lot of, a lot, a lot of microbes yeah. in our digestive tract, on our skin, in our mouth, on our mucous membranes. And they are part of our ecosystem as human beings. Mm-hmm. And um, there's a balance. If we think of balance in the environment on many different scales, there's balance all through nature yeah. and balance on our bodies. Right. And those microbes are there as part of our barrier, right? Mm-hmm. Even in our gut, they're part of a healthy mucus barrier. Yeah. And they help digest, like the bacteria, the, the beneficial bacteria can help us digest fibers and foods that we can. Yeah. And they produce different vitamins and that we may not be able to absorb as well or mm-hmm. produce on our own. Mm-hmm. And that is all, a lot of that, that ecosystem is influenced by, again, stress, uh, again, what what we're eating. Yeah. So, are you eating a plant based diet full of these prebiotic fibers that feed our our, our little microbial friends so yeah. they can survive? Yeah. Or are we eating, you know, everything out of a bag that supports some of these other bad boy bacteria that yeah. aren't as that are or can be pathological? They can cause issues. Yeah. So, you know, your behavior, the things you eat, the way you think supports a certain um, profile of microbiome. Right. Right? There's maybe thousands of species of bacteria. Who knows how many exactly? Yeah. It's Nobody hard to does. measure. Yeah. They haven't all been discovered uh, yet. Yeah. It's, it, for whatever reason, it's really, it's hard. I think it's hard to test accurately. Right. Um, so, um, we know it's part of our immune system. <laughs> it's a, yeah. Right. We have to take care of it. So when people say you have to have a balance of, in your microbiome, are they talking about a, the balance of all the good gut bacteria balancing together? Or are they talking about a balance between good and bad gut bacteria? My understanding is it's both because if we think of the surface area of the, your, your gut lining, it's a limited space. Yeah. So when the good outnumber the bad, they, they kind of push out some of the, the bad bacteria. They don't l- allow you know yeast, candida, to overgrow. Okay. Uh, it's almost like predators and prey in the environment. You know, you can, there's a certain number that helps balance the ecosystem. Okay. Support the ecosystem, and it'll support you. Yeah. And, uh, you know, as science kind of catches up, we'll be able to explain why. And that's, that's probably the, the best advice on that whole thing, because it's not really for us to worry about as much as just get healthy and eat healthy food. Healthy food, especially vegetables and organic sources, lots of different colors of the rainbow, nourishes the bacteria. And then the bacteria decide what to do with it. But if we're eating junk food all the time and processed food, then the bacteria doesn't even have a chance to, because what you said earlier, the natural state of the body is to be well. And if it's not, it's because we're not giving it a chance to do that. Exactly. Can you... What we call, well, in naturopathic medicine, we call them determinants of health. Yeah. You know, what are those conditions for health? Yeah. And how do you incorporate more of those into your life? Right. Because we can, if you are always waiting for someone to prove to you that sleeping is good for you, yeah, you know, we might not actually be able to figure out the exact mechanism, yeah, until like you're dead, yeah. Right. So, right. in my mind, it seems reasonable to do the things uh, that will support health, mm-hmm. that which are you know safe which yeah. makes sense to me, which yeah. from the experience of other people who tend to be healthy, 
Yeah. Those are those things are what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Like I'm gonna do I'm gonna do most of those things and evaluate whether or not it works for me. Yeah, right. Exactly. And I want to talk about antibiotics because that probably has the biggest effect on the gut microbiome. So two part question, what does it do to the gut bacteria? And then when we're done with our antibiotic dose or program, what can we do to replenish the, the flora and rebuild everything that's been, that's been decimated by the antibiotic use? Yes, so antibiotics, a lot of them are not, so let's say you have a sinus infection and your doctor says, here's some, you know, clindamycin or whatever it is. Yeah. Do it for a week or whatever course you're prescribed. You're, it's being absorbed through your gut, right, if you're yeah. taking it orally. Yeah. And it's also, it's not just a, maybe getting into your system to take care of the sinus infection, but it's also maybe affecting a lot of those beneficial bacteria, mm-hmm. right? It's like dropping a nuclear bomb when maybe a knife would have been just fine yeah. into your body. Right. All right. There's collateral damage. Yeah. There's always another effect. Mm-hmm. We call them side effects, but they're actually effects that we just don't want. <laughs> so, yeah, right. Negative effects. Yeah. <laughs> Negative effects, yeah. yeah. We call them side effects because like, oops. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Oh, darn. <laughs> yeah, we should. I like collateral damage. That's what we should be calling it. That's a better term. Yeah. So it's when it, I think there's a tendency to forget that there are, are negative sequela for, you know, negative consequences yeah. for this beneficial, this otherwise beneficial therapy. So, you know, you're, you're if someone's taking a course of antibiotics because they have to, you know, they can start having digestive issues, malabsorption, you know, you're throwing off your microbiome. Yeah. Uh, so then what do you do afterwards? So, you know, a good probiotic is typically what I will recommend. Okay. Um, there's different brands of different, uh, different types, but maybe we don't get into that specifically. Yeah. But then how do you get back into eating the foods that support a healthy ecosystem again? Yeah. Uh, you know, Plant foods, mushrooms, leeks, onions, garlic, right. you know, those, those really diverse uh, whole foods. Yeah, right, right. Fermented foods, kimchi, sauerkraut. There you go. Uh, yeah. Kefir, if you can handle dairy. Yeah. So there's a lot of like traditional, um, you know, ethnic foods that mm-hmm. are, that support healthy, healthy, a healthy microbiome. I, personally, so, but, I believe, you know, that should be my antibiotic should be the last resort, not the yeah. first. Yeah, yeah, you know, right. not the first line treatment. Right. Personally, I tell people you should be eating fermented vegetables of some some kind every single day, and whether that's kimchi or sauerkraut, there's there's this huge explosion lately in the last year or two of of all different flavors of sauerkraut. So when people wince at the word sauerkraut, they think it's going to be gross because of their experience then you haven't tried all the different flavors and varieties because some of it's pretty darn good. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But um, I also heard somewhere, I don't know if this is true, that since, since um, antibiotics kill off so many gut bacteria and just bacteria in general, it's good to take probiotics and or fermented vegetables while you're on antibiotics, but not within a few hours of actually taking the dose. Because of the, you know, like you said, the nuclear bomb is exploding and now you're just wasting your money. If you take a bunch of probiotics and then chase it with your antibiotics, then that's a waste of money. Is that true? From what I understand, yes. That, I mean, it just doesn't make sense to me either. Yeah. You know, you're, because, yeah, I mean, for that few days, there's no real use taking a probiotic. Yeah. Um, so okay. you know, wait till after you're done. Right, right. And this is, it's so fascinating to talk about this with you because it's such a new field and we're learning something new in this field every single day. And there's lots of questions that people have that I'm sure you don't even know the answer to yet because it's so new. Just kind of like me with exercise and nutrition. I learn new stuff every single day from a new study that comes out. It's like, oh my gosh, really? Wow, that's fascinating. And so we're getting better every day, but that's why... It's so interesting to me is because it's new. 
So and you're essentially a pioneer in this field and learning stuff. So which brings to my next question is, where do you get your information? And um, when do you do research? How do you do it? That kind of stuff. Because um, doctors like you, especially naturopaths, have to rely on that. Because a medical doctor relies on their education and what people tell them, especially the pharmaceutical industry. Um, but naturopaths, chiropractors, other natural doctors, osteopaths, um, um, functional medicine functional, doctors. Yes, functional medicine practitioners, huge. You guys all have to do your own stuff. You got to, I mean, sure, you're learning from each other, but the, the, the most of the responsibility for getting better and treating your patients because you're, you're focusing on the cause, not treating symptoms, is research, learning stuff. So how do you do that? Yeah, there, you're right. There's so many ways, and uh, we call it medicine of practice because you're, it's always, there's always something new. Things that we thought were true, we find out are either not quite true yeah. or we, we were refining our understanding. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's a humbling, you know, something I said today might, we might change our understanding of what the microbiome does and yeah. how it works. Yeah. And that's, that's the case, you know, I accept that. Um, and how do I learn? I think how, how I learn is always being curious, Yeah. right? Being open-minded is kind of step one. Right. If, I don't really think of treating a person in terms of protocols. You know, what did someone tell me how to treat, you know, oh, someone has this condition, I have to give them X, Y, and Z. Yeah. It, there are some rough strategies, Yeah. but then I'm always questioning, does this make sense for, the, yeah. for this person in this situation? Right. Um, I really like to understand mechanisms. Yeah. Like in biochemistry, what are the interactions? How do these molecules work? Yeah. I, I, with visceral manipulation, I'm always refining my knowledge of anatomy. Yeah. You know, what is the innervation of an organ? What is the function of the organ? What are the blood? You know, what are the uh, arterial kind of networks supply of the organ look like, and how do I treat those? Yeah. Um, I tend to go to conferences. Yeah. You know. Uh, progressive conferences from different with with practitioners from different fields because I think sometimes you can get tunnel vision yeah. working in a certain field and you only right. think about a problem in a certain way. Yeah. So how do I broaden that? Yeah. What are the functional medicine chiropractors doing? Yeah. What are the functional medicine medical doctors doing? Yeah. That's great. <laughs> what are the manual therapists learning about? The fascia. Yeah how they all work together, you know, what are the psychologists learning about mindset and how that influences your biochemistry. Yeah. You know, it, so just yeah. talking about it, it can yeah. feel overwhelming. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, you know, I, I try to approach my learning in a on demand basis. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, I'm seeing a patient, they're dealing with chronic constipation. That's not really responding to anything. Yeah. What else can I learn? Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. It's a, I guess, like just in time learning. Yeah. Okay. Otherwise, it's just, <laughs> it's just so much. Yeah. And so that, that's kind of how I think about it. You know, what is the problem I need to solve now, and what's the best way? What are ways I can address this specific question? Gotcha. So I'm also curious about um, why did you branch off into this specialty of visceral manipulation? Yeah. It all. It, uh, did, you know, I mentioned probably at the beginning that I didn't plan on being a doctor. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I graduated from college with a business degree. Mm -hmm. I was working at a, a startup in Mountain View, California, doing search engine marketing, right? working on Google ads for like eHarmony, uh, you, know, you know, different price grabber, you know, these kind of big yeah. e-commerce sites. Yeah. And 2008 rolls around, I get laid off. Uh, at that point, I was really kind of feeling like I wasn't making a difference, mm. like doing something meaningful yeah. in my life. But I didn't quite listen to that that that, that gut feeling, right? There it goes again, that gut feeling. Yeah. I didn't listen to it. Yeah. So I started working at MySpace.com when MySpace was already being overtaken by Facebook in the market. Right. Um, I was really stressed out because I just didn't like going to work every day. I dreaded it. <laughs> Yeah. The commute was painful. Yeah. I would sit there. I didn't, you know, my 
I didn't really like my manager or <laughs> the people I was around. And yeah. I woke up one day with like eczema on my face, with, like oh my these gosh. blotchy patches of dry, scaly skin on my neck and my face. I'm like, yeah. what's going on? Yeah. And not really knowing what I know now, it's like I went to my doctor, my primary care doctor, mm -hmm. and he, you know, I, I talked to him for 15 minutes. Really nice guy, yeah. but he's like, you know, here's two tubes of steroid cream. <laughs> And I ask him, what do you think is going on? He's like, eh, maybe it's an allergic reaction. No one really knows. Yeah. Okay. And then I ask him, how long do I have to use this for? Uh, he's like, well, off and on for the rest of your life. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, me having no medical education at that point, it, that didn't make sense to me. Yeah. Like, if I have to use a steroid cream every day for the rest of my life, yeah. something is not right. Yeah, it's not, you don't have the condition because of your deficiency of steroid cream. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Something else is going on. Um, so that was kind of one wake up call. And, you know, I got laid off from MySpace in six months because the company imploded. Yeah. And that was my opportunity to think, okay, I'm going to pursue something different. My mom's a pharmacist, and she said, if I were to do it again, I'd say to be a naturopathic doctor and go to Bastyr in Seattle. So kind of all those events, seeing my grandmothers right. at the end of their life going through the hospital system, feeling wow. helpless, yeah. you know, doctors not really looking, they were prescribing medications based on their numbers, not on their, yeah. not really looking at the quality of their life. Yeah. So all that experience together led me down this route of naturopathic medicine. And, and you know, I just start, started looking for different ways to help people feel better and to understand what it means to be healthy and how to be healthy huh. and how I can use my hands yeah. to influence someone's health and well-being. Yeah. yeah. I just found I gravitated towards working with my hands. Okay. So what was the day or, or paradigm shift where you said, wow, this visceral manipulation stuff is really cool. I want to go down that road a little bit more. Let's see. There's so many examples. One is, you know, experiencing in a class, what happens okay. to your own body over the course of six weeks, even at the hands of someone who's very new? Huh. Uh, yeah. I actually started with craniosacral therapy. Oh, okay. You know, school is a very stressful. It's one of the most. One of my teachers was like, "School is about one of the worst. Medical school is one of the worst things you can do for your health." Yeah. And I really felt that. You know, yeah, <laughs> I was like, right. I was a mess, oh, anxious, yeah. feeling anxious and stressed out. Sure. But I had this craniosacral class over the summer, hmm. six weeks in a row. Hmm. Every week you're working with a part with partners. You're getting worked on. You're working on people. Yeah. And by the end of the six weeks, I felt so much more grounded. Wow. I felt even my response to stressors was different. Um, and yeah. using these skills in a, in the clinic situation, where you know they're they're patients who are talking in circles, right? Yeah. They get stuck in that story. They're just on, you know, verbal diarrhea mode. Sure. And you can't, you can't talk them out of it. Yeah. So, you know, I, I work with the patients like, why don't you just lie down? We'll do some craniosacral and see what happens. Yeah. You know, you know, the right. patient stopped, stopped, you know, the verbal diarrhea stopped. So yeah. we put the brakes on that. <laughs> and as she's walking out the door, she's like, you know what? I haven't told you guys this, but you know, there's a, she started re telling us about, the deep rooted kind of traumatic experience she had 10, 15 years ago wow. that she never brought up yeah. otherwise. Yeah. Cool. And it's like those moments like that. I'm like, Holy yeah. crap. I don't yeah. know what I did. Yeah. I don't know exactly how I did it, <laughs> right. but I knew my intention was good. Yeah. And, <laughs> and somehow that positive energy, that therapeutic relationship was that trust was built. Yeah. So that patient was able to open up. Yeah. Huh. And it's, you know, so that's what's like, is there so much more than just the thing you give someone to take? Totally. The thing you tell them to do. Yeah. It's that, that, that relationship you build with someone, uh, yeah. how you communicate, yeah. how you communicate with your hands. And that, I was sold on like manual therapy. So cranial sac, do you do cranial sacral as well? A little bit. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's so a little bit different. Why did you go more different. down the visceral than the craniosacral? Craniosacral works more with the system of the 
the brain and the, sp the central nervous system okay. and fluids around the central nervous system. It's beneficial in a lot of cases. Yeah. Uh, but visceral manipulation, I found for a lot of the issues I was de seeing with patients, digestive issues, chronic gotcha. pain, pelvic issues. Yeah. It was just a tool set that kind of fit what I was working with most. Gotcha. And, and sometimes I will pull out the craniosacral therapy if, yeah. if necessary. Yeah, interesting. Okay. And then you mentioned um, a mentor that's been really valuable to you. And what I've found is every, without exception, every successful person that's, you know, a guru was mentored by a guru. Yeah. Mentorship. Um, I was, I remember being afraid to ask people for help it, when I was younger. I was too shy, too nervous, didn't think it would uh, really, I thought I could do it on my own. But working with uh, my mentor, Dr. Ron Mariotti, he teaches visceral manipulation. Like over the course of the last two years of working like with him, shadowing him, I still shadow him you know, once a week when I can. I TA his classes. To have someone there look at what you're doing and give you honest feedback, like to give that close that feedback loop. There, I think there are a lot of practitioners who learn something. Uh, like over the weekend and go and try to do it in their practice, but no one tells them if they're doing it wrong or how they could do it better. <laughs> right? yeah. so, uh, or working with a coach, you know, yeah. who's a trainer, uh, someone who can correct your form and say, yeah. Hey, you're messing that up. Right. Because you can practice all you want, but if you're practicing the wrong thing, yeah. you're only going to get the, the wrong thing. You're going to get really good at doing the wrong thing. Yeah. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So I like to ask people these four questions, and the first one is, uh, what book has taught you the most about health? What's your favorite book? I think health is so much more than maybe we think. You know, it's your experience in life. Yeah. Uh, homeopathy, it's a whole other system of medicine yeah. within that we use in naturopathic medicine, but health is defined as freedom, freedom. Freedom, you know, freedom to do yeah. what you want, how you want, when you want. Right. And one of the books I think that helped me the most kind of frame that is actually not really a health uh, It is a health book, but uh, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. Oh. So he was a Holocaust survivor. He became a, a psychotherapist, or he was yeah. a psychotherapist. Huh. And he observed, why do some people in these camps survive longer than others? Yeah. And it, he... It, to boil it down, he, he determined that the people who had a sense of purpose and meaning and who could see the meaning in their suffering tended to survive longer. Interesting. Yeah. And I read this book during a really tough time in my life wondering, you know, what the heck am I doing? Yeah. Because no matter, you know, you go through life, you're going to encounter difficulties, sickness, illness. Yeah. You know, the, the, the patients who can tend to thrive, yeah. take some type of meaning from their suffering. Yeah. And they don't view it as, oh, woe is me, but oh, you know, how can I make the best of this? Yeah, gotcha. And that's, that's um, great. That, really, that really kind of set like the, the bigger principle between, behind health. It's yeah. you know, having some source of meaning in your life, yeah. creating meaning, finding finding the meaning in the difficult times. Nice. And what's the most exciting thing you've learned in the last year recently? <clears throat> oh, oh, there's so many things. Yeah. Um, I, I think one that really stood out to me recently was, um, I wrote his name down, uh, Yoshimori, yeah, Yoshimori Osumi. So the Japanese researcher who who won the Nobel Prize for figuring out how fasting, the mechanism of fasting, and how it helps to promote autophagy, which is the body's natural process for you know, cleaning up old cells yeah. and regenerating itself. Yeah. And this shows the power of the healing power of nature. That's yeah. one of the naturopathic principles. Yeah. How do you harness the healing power of nature? Right. So fasting used to be thought of as this weird, weird thing that hippies used to do. Like, why would you fast? Yeah. It's like, oh, fasting is a natural process for your body to repair itself. Uh -huh. And now it takes research, a researcher to win a Nobel Prize to maybe even think of, oh, yeah. it's not just quackery. <laughs> so 
Yeah, right. <laughs> and what's the what's been the biggest thing you've changed your mind about over the years? Um, I've changed my mind about how important willpower is. Hmm. So, meaning, let me let me explain. Mm -hmm. So. I think oftentimes if we think of lifestyle diseases like type 2 diabetes, we, it, I, I don't know if it's an industrialized medicine thing to place the responsibility on the person and to say that person made the wrong choice. They're a slob. They're lazy. Yeah. That's why they have type 2 diabetes. Yeah. But now I'm realizing how important the environment is yeah. influencing our decisions, mm -hmm. whether we are conscious of it or not. Yeah. And just in my own life, how do I implement change? It's the things that stick are the ones that where I've in, changed my environment, the mm -hmm. people I'm around, mm -hmm. who you know, where I am, how I do things. It's that's how I promote healthy behaviors. Yeah. So that environment is more important than trying to just do the right thing all the time, gotcha. because we will fail as human beings. Totally. We we don't have that amount. That mass, most of us don't have that massive willpower to yeah. overcome a shitty environment. Exactly. Me, like. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's great. And then last question is, if Dr. Chedros, the leader of World Health Organization, um, told you, give me one request and I will make it happen, what would that request be of him? <laughs> Before this, I was trying to figure out how much power does this guy have. I know. But let's imagine well, in, he's in, like a genie. Yeah, <laughs> it, yeah. In this case, he's a magic genie. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, I recently watched a, a documentary called "Wasted," uh -huh. produced by Anthony Bourdain, about food waste in the U.S. Oh. And there were some shocking numbers. Uh, you know, forty percent of the food produced in America goes to waste. Wow. Ten million tons of Produce does not even, you know, on farms does not even reach people. Wow. Right? It's grown, yeah. but it just goes to waste. So wow. my request would be, how can we harness some of this unutilized mm -hmm. wasted food, whether it's in, in America or all over the world, and how can we distribute that evenly yeah. across, uh, across, you know, to people who need it? Yeah. And also... Like less wasted food influences the environment. Yeah. It influences how we, you know, maybe produce energy, use produce renewable energy. Um, there's so many bigger environmental benefits of decreasing food waste. Yeah. Wow. So um, I don't know how this magic genie is going to fix this. Well, he, but, <laughs> probably the first thing he'd do is come to America and shut down all the clam jumper restaurants. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's yeah. a, that's an interesting um point because you go to a claim jumpers and then you, you and you see them bring these massive plates of food that no one is able to finish and then you go over to Europe oh, and then you watch the, our people eat this food. We just wolf it down. And then you go over to Europe and you see people take 3 hours to eat their meal at a restaurant with their friends and it's in seven different courses and each course is a little tiny plate. And by the time they're done, there's no food wasted. And if, and because they have time to get full during the meal and it's good food, lots of different flavors. So their, their palate becomes satisfied as opposed to the claim jumper people that just wolf it down and leave some and get over full and, and, and waste. Yeah, and it's not even just at the restaurants, but we think of our whole – in the documentary, there's waste when we're catching fish, right? Yep. For every pound of desired fish you want, there's six pounds of bycatch. Gotcha. So bycatch wow. is like, oops, we didn't mean to catch those fish. Oh, my it's just So, you know, those, yeah. those animals are harmed. They die. They don't actually end up in, in the food system. Wow, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's it's unbelievable. Grocery stores purposely stock more than they need to to kind of give the illusion of abundance, oh, so yeah. that oh you know mm -hmm. I, there's no there's more where that came from. Yeah, um, I'll just give you a quick example. Yeah, one of the big things is we're so disconnected from where our food comes from. We don't yeah. really care as much. Yeah, but I started 
I decided to grow my own shiitake mushrooms. Mm-hmm. And, you know, over the course of just kind of growing these, my own little shiitake babies, I started referring to them as my babies. Yeah. Because, you know, they're so much more invested when you grow something on your own. I'm not going to oh, waste great. any of those mushrooms. Yeah. Oh, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a, lot, there's a lot less of that that ownership and accountability about what the food we get because we think, oh, it just came off the Trader Joe's shelf. Yeah. That's funny. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. We lose touch with the whole process. Yeah. Interesting. Wow. Well, thanks. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add? I know I've taken a lot of your time and I'm sorry that it took so much, but wow, it's just too fun. I couldn't stop talking. I couldn't stop asking questions. That was great. <laughs> Yeah, no, your, your questions got me fired up. So I, <laughs> I, 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 I've said enough, I think. <laughs> yeah, right on. Well, thanks so much for your time. And can you tell us how to contact you? Yeah, you, you can find me at aaronchoi.com, A-R-O-N-C-H-O-I.com. I post articles on there. Um, I write essays on medium.com. So if you go to medium.com slash, I think it's at Aaron Choi, A-R-O-N-C-H-O-I, pretty straightforward. Those are probably the best ways to stay up to date with what I'm doing. Great. Right on. And then your clinic is, is where? My clinic is in uh, Seattle. Uh-huh. It's uh, near the university district near university village. Okay. So I have my private practice there. Right on. Well, thanks a ton and thanks for your time. Yeah. And that was, that was a very stimulating conversation. All right. And likewise, BJ. Thanks for, yeah, thanks. Thanks for the great questions. All right. Talk to you later. All right.